No, I was just talking to them, not C-SPAN, yeah. Good morning. This hearing will come to order. Today, the Interior Environment Subcommittee continues with a series of budget hearings for fiscal year 2020. Uh, this morning, we will hear about the President's budget request for the Environmental Protection Agency. Joining us this morning is Administrator Andrew Wheeler, and uh, with him today is EPA Chief Financial Officer Holly Graves. Ms. Graves was with us last year when the EPA presented its budget request for 2019. Um, Mr. Wheeler, I believe this is your first appearance in the House and your first before Congress since assuming your new role uh, after being confirmed by the Senate a little over a month ago. Is that right? Well, congratulations, and we're very happy to have you here, and welcome to you both. Um, <clears throat> the Environmental Protection Agency has an, an essential mission. The dedicated employees of the EPA work every day to protect human health and the health of our environment. They are defenders of our clean water and clean air. They protect Americans from exposures to toxic chemicals. Sadly, the President's budget for fiscal year 2020 completely fails to support the EPA's mission. President Trump's request for $6.1 billion for the EPA, which is $2.8 billion below FYI, FY, excuse me, 2019 enacted level of $8.9 billion. The request is a cut in simple terms, of more than 30 percent below the 2019 enacted level. It's the largest proposed cut to any cabinet-level agency in the government. This budget proposes to cut the EPA's research by 34 percent, cuts the state water revolving funds, which finance clean water and drinking infrastructure, by a combined 30 percent. Eliminates funding for programs that prevents exposure to toxic substances like lead paint and radon and cuts $30 million for programs that remove lead from drinking water at schools and homes. It would eliminate funding for most of the regional watershed activities, including Long Island Sound, Puget Sound, and the budget proposes a 90 percent cut for the Chesapeake Bay Restoration and the Great Lakes Initiative. However, the President recently flip-flopped on his plans to cut the Great Lakes funding. Uh, he did get a big round of applause in, at a Michigan rally. But that still doesn't change the fact that the EPA, for three years in a row, President Trump has proposed to slash the funds for the Great Lakes, and Congress, frankly, has just ignored that and fully funded the program. So, Mr. Wheeler, I'm not sure if he's told you if he wants you to cut something else now instead of the Great Lakes, but I hope it won't be any further cuts to the uh, environmental justice work, which has already reduced 60 percent in this budget. EPA programs from Indian Country don't fare any better. Overall, there's a 28 percent cut to programs serving tribes for clean water infrastructure, the handling of hazardous waste, monitoring, and protecting air quality. The administration talks about cooperative federalism. But the budget request once again proposes to cut categorical grants by 46 percent. States and tribes rely on these funds to help operate their delegated air, water, and waste responsibilities. This budget tells the states and the tribes to just, you know, go find a way to go fund themselves and to do their important work. But unfortunately, for the last two years, um, we've had this in front of us. So Congress has decided again and again to reject these disastrous proposed cuts by the EPA on a bipartisan, bicameral basis. And I imagine that's what we'll do again. But rather than spending our time today focused on the unrealistic budget requests, I plan to examine what the EPA has been doing with the money we have already appropriated. Frankly, a lot of the EPA's actions don't make sense, or at worst, they appear to fly in the face of congressional directives. EPA's understaffing, misguided priorities mean that the agency is failing to deliver the basic protections <coughs> for human health, the environment that the American people expect. For example, instead of safeguarding our families from the threats posed by toxic chemicals, EPA leadership has tried to bury, delay, undermine, or ignore the work of its own scientists for chemicals like methylene chloride, 
formaldehyde or chloroporphyrus. Despite level funding for the past several years, we have seen a sharp drop off <coughs> in enforcement activity agency. This appears to be the result of an exodus of enforcement personnel whose positions haven't been filled. Combined with a new series of bureaucratic hoops and enforce that enforcement agencies must jump through. And finally, climate change. When it comes to pollution from cars, instead of working with the states and the American car companies to come up with a win-win on fuel economy and greenhouse gas emission standards, <coughs> the administration has pursued a path that even the auto industry here at home opposes. When it comes to emissions of hydrofluorocarbons, some of the most potent greenhouse gases out there, senior e EPA officials are opposed to the president submitting the Kagawi Amendment to the Montreal Protocol for Senate ratification. This amendment would phase out an older class of refrigerants with a new class of less harmful ones. The ratification is not just supported by the environmental community. It's all supported by the National Association of Manufacturers, the American Chemistry Council, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Apparently, the only people who think that these EPA policies aren't good ideas are people in the administration. And I believe the American people deserve better than this. The EPA's mission to protect public health and not to protect the bottom line of polluters. This club committee will be doing its part to make sure that the EPA lives up to its mission. And so at this time, I would like to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Joyce, for his opening remarks. Thank you for yielding, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Welcome to your first hearing before the subcommittee, Administrator Wheeler, and congratu congratulations on your confirmation as the 15th Administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you and your Chief Financial Officer, Holly Greaves, for being here to discuss the administration's fiscal 2020 EPA budget proposal. It's great to have a fellow Buckeye join us. Mr. Wheeler, I applaud your work as Acting Administrator and now as Administrator. You've identified agency efficiencies, advanced common sense reforms, and reduced regulatory burdens to sp spur economic growth. You have simultaneously prioritized EPA's core mission to protect the public health and the environment. In 2018, you led EPA's efforts to clean up more than two dozen Superfund sites and remove them from the national priority list, reduced greenhouse gas emissions from major industrial sources, and made strides to address the nation's enormous uh, water infrastructure backlog by completing construction loans totaling more than $2 billion. We look forward to working with you to continue advancing such reforms while remaining good stewards of our environmental resources. We must also ensure that the federal government, along with our state and tribal partners, has enough resources in place to continue protecting and preserving our natural resources. The fiscal year 2020 budget proposal for the EPA is $6.07 billion, which is $2 billion or 25 percent below the base fiscal year 2019 enacted level. As such, it is disproportionately deeper cut than the 9 percent non-defense discretionary cut mandated under the current law. In places, many of my colleagues and I generally agree uh, with the deeper cuts were necessary to, to continue to scale back the federal government's regulatory overreach. But I suspect I am joined by many colleagues to, on both sides of the aisle in disagreeing with proposed cuts to partnerships and programs that help states and tribes meet federal mandates. Since coming to Congress on behalf of Ohio's 14th District, I've never been shy about my strong support for the Great Lakes. The Great Lakes are an invaluable natural resource, a true national treasure, and an economic powerhouse, so it remains of utmost importance to preserve and protect them for future generations. The Great Lakes directly support over 1.5 million jobs, holds 90% of our nation's fresh water, and generates $62 billion in annual wages. That is why the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is so essential to address the most persistent and challenging issue, like invasive species, toxic substances, and non-point source pollution that threaten those resources. However, the administration's request for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, a $270 million or 90% reduction from fiscal year 2019 enacted level, falls well short of the necessary funding level to achieve those ends. Consistent with years past, you can be assured that I will work tirelessly with Chair McCollum to provide full GLRI funding. I also look forward to clar you clarifying the administration's desired funding level for the fiscal year 2020 in light of the President's supportive remarks just last week. In addition to the GLRI, the budget proposes reducing or terminating all other geographic programs, the popular Rural Water Technical Assistance Grants, the National Estuary Program, infrastructure assistance to Alaska Native Villages, and a number of other important programs. 
Similarly, the, 30, the proposed 30 percent reduction in the EPA's research funding poses an issue. EPA's research plays a decisive role in which in studying PFAS and other potentially drink, drinking water contaminants, harmful algal blooms, and other public health research initiatives. Despite these concerns, I was pleased to see that the administration continues to prioritize water quality infrastructure because these remain of utmost concern to my constituents and me. The request provides nearly $2 billion for the clean water and drinking water state revolving funds, $83 million for new grant programs authorized under the America Water Infrastructure Act, and $25 million for the WIFIA program. Given the leveraging capacity of the WIFIA program and the revolving nature of the SRFs, the request could spur billions of dollars in water infrastructure investments and help create construction jobs in every state. The request also includes more than a billion dollars for the Superfund program to accelerate the pace of cleanups and return sites to beneficial use and economic development. This includes $472 million specifically for the remedial program to tackle the 13,000-plus sites on the Superfund national priorities list. Lastly, I look forward to hearing about the agency's PFAS action plan, <coughs> ongoing work to update the lead and copper rule, and the proposed $50 million Healthy Schools Grant Program to address potential gaps in school environment health. With that, Administrator Wheeler, thank you for being here. I look forward to your testimony and thoughtful discussion ahead of us. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Joyce. With that, I uh, turn to the full chair of the Appropriations Committee, Ms. Lowy, for any opening remarks she would like to make, madam. Thank you, Chair McCullum, Ranking Member Joyce, for holding this hearing, and welcome, Administrator Wheeler. I'm having deja vu as I look at another Trump budget request that would drastically slash the EPA, in this case, by more than 30 percent. Despite Congress's repeated rejections of the Trump budget cuts, you again propose to eliminate programs that are important to our environment and in the wrong direction. I just don't get it. Why is the Trump administration steering our country in the wrong direction? And you are part of that effort. Climate change is a threat to the nation. We must act now to avoid its most severe impacts. And yet the Trump administration is steering us in the wrong direction. Even though the EPA's budget justification claims to prioritize funding for initiatives to improve our air quality, it proposes to cut the Office of Air and Radiation by 45 percent and to eliminate 27 percent of the office's staff. It's pretty obvious that these cuts will result in dirty air and weaken public health. The justification claims to prioritize chemical safety, but proposes to eliminate programs that evaluate the risks of endocrine disruptors, the Pollution Prevention Program, the Beach Protection Program, which protect Americans from pollutants in the air we breathe, and in recreational waters. Your budget also falls short in the EPA's mission to ensure safe and clean water. You propose drastic cuts to water infrastructure finance and Inv Innovation Act investments, the state revolving funds, research on safe and sustainable water resources. I'm especially disappointed that EPA has decided to delay rulemaking to protect Americans from toxic chemicals like methylene chloride. It also continued to suppress its own science about the risk of chemicals like formaldehyde, pesticides, and more. I'm equally dismayed your agency would endanger public health and safety by prioritizing the genders of big polluters when evaluating Superfund cleanup sites like the Hudson River PCB contamination. These cuts send a clear message about the agency's priorities to put polluter interests above public health. 
We have grown to expect this from the Trump administration, sadly, over the last two years. Instead of pursuing climate and clean air solutions to protect the planet and the economy, your agency is pursuing an agenda that is so extreme that in many cases, even industry is not asking for it. Frankly, as you can see, this budget is a disappointment I'm almost sorry for you that you have to sit here and defend this budget. This is the first smile I've seen, so maybe <laughs> you're going to change your mind in your presentation. But frankly, I think it's an embarrassment for you to be there and defend this budget. And the American people deserve better. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Lawley. Well, Mr. Wheeler, the time is yours. Um, your full remarks will be entered into the record along with any um, materials <coughs> you wish to submit uh, in, in supporting that. Once again, welcome. Mr. Wheeler, the, the uh, floor is yours. I thought the green light minute was on, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, <laughs> Chair McCollum, Ranking Member Joyce, and members of the subcommittee and the full committee chair. I'm joined today by Holly Greaves, EPO's CFO, and we're here today to discuss EPA's proposed 2020 budget. The budget request ensures that the agency can continue President Trump's bold agenda and the tremendous progress we've made over the past two years. The U.S. is a global leader in clean air and access to safe drinking water and we are cleaning up contaminated lands at the fastest pace in over a decade. At the same time, EPA has finalized 38 deregulatory actions, saving Americans more than $3 billion in regulatory costs. We have an additional 39 actions in development projected to save billions more. The Trump administration is proving that environmental protection and historic economic growth can go hand in hand. My testimony will highlight how the President's budget would continue this progress. I believe that water issues, from drinking water to marine litter to infrastructure, are the largest and most immediate environmental issue affecting the world right now. The budget request provides critical support for water quality protection. One challenge we face is lead exposure. Through the new Federal Lead Action Plan, EPA is coordinating with our federal counterparts to reduce childhood lead exposure. Yesterday, we issued a status report to hold ourselves accountable to the public and clearly communicate the steps we are taking to implement the action plan. To bolster these efforts, the budget proposes $50 million to establish a new Healthy Schools grant program to reduce exposure to lead or other toxics found in schools. We are also moving forward to update the lead and copper rule for the first time in over two decades. Our proposal will ensure that we address the most corrosive pipes in the most at-risk communities first. Another challenge is addressing potential sources of contamination. In February, EPA released its PFAS Action Plan, the most comprehensive multimedia research and action plan ever issued by the agency to address an emerging chemical of concern. On the marine litter issue, billions of pounds of waste enter our oceans each year harming marine life and coastal economies. EPA's Trash-Free Waters Program is stepping up to help the international community capture marine litter or prevent it from reaching the oceans. On infrastructure, the President's budget includes a 25% increase in WIFIA from last year's request. This new program is already producing tremendous results. To date, EPA has issued eight WIFIA loans, totaling more than $2 billion in federal credit assistance. Last week, we announced our third round of funding, which could support $12 billion in water infrastructure projects and create more than 180,000 jobs. To expand on these efforts, President Trump signed America's Water Infrastructure Act, OWEA. While funding for OWEA was not included in the fiscal year 2019 appropriations Congress enacted, EPA proposes funding of $83 million in the budget request to begin implementation of this new law. 
The budget request also includes approximately $2 billion in federal dollars to the two SRFs. The combination of federal grants, state matches, repayments, and interest all flow back into each revolving fund, creating $80 billion in the nationwide fund, well beyond the annual federal SRF investments. Regarding the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, as the President stated, this is a unique and important program, and I fully support his decision as it relates to funding this program. When it comes to reducing air pollution, we're moving forward with common sense reforms that would help more communities reach attainment of the NAAQS standards. For example, we are set to announce this week that the Cleveland area is now meeting the standards for particulate matter. The cleanup of contaminated lands also plays a crucial role in revitalizing communities throughout the country. In fiscal year 2018, EPA deleted all or part of 22 sites from the national priorities list, the largest number of deletions in one year since fiscal year 2005. Our next responsibility is ensuring that chemicals used in commerce and sold in the marketplace are safe for public use. I'm proud to report that EPA continues to meet the major statutory deadlines of the amended TSCA. Earlier this month, we finalized a ban on the retail sales of methylene chloride for consumer paint and coating removal, the first risk management action under Section 6 of amended TSCA. To ensure our efforts are effective and durable, EPA has a healthy and robust enforcement program. At one end of the spectrum, we are increasing compliance through self-audits, which are often the quickest way to correct environmental harms. At the other end of the spectrum, we are deterring noncompliance by increasing the number of new criminal cases, reversing a downward trend that began in 2011. We want the public to know that when they encounter environmental threats, we will address them head on. And we want the world to know that when they encounter environmental threats, we are ready to help. This is the type of leadership that gives confidence to the public, the regulated community, and our allies around the globe. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Um, I'm going to yield at this time for the uh, full committee chair to ask her question. And um, um, Mr. Wheeler, as you know, that there are many other appropriations subcommittee hearings taking place at the same time, so people will be coming and going. No disrespect is, is, is me meant at all. Um, I'll stay here the whole time. <laughs> you and you, me and Mr. <laughs> Joyce, I think the three of us all will be here the whole time. Uh, Ms. Lowy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I do apologize, but it's one of those mornings, and I appreciate the opportunity to spend a few minutes with you. Um, New York, as you know, is among 14 states that adopted California's vehicle emission standards. Unfortunately, the administration proposed to preempt state car rules and freeze emission standards. To say that I am concerned about this short-sighted action is an understatement, and reports indicate that EPA staff felt their technical input was ignored during the drafting of the administration's proposed rule. Further, staff analysis showed the Department of Transportation's modeling was fundamentally flawed. Those flaws were not remedied before the draft rule was published. As EPA was intended to be an equal partner in writing the rule, did DOT fully incorporate EPA's expert technical analysis and data in the final proposal? And if so, will its technical analysis and expertise be captured in the final rule? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for the, Chairman, for the question. Um, the proposal we actually put out a couple weeks after I became the acting administrator. One of the things that I did before I signed the proposed regulation was sit down with the, the career technical staff, both from Washington, D.C. and Ann Arbor, to make sure that their views were taken into account. And it was about a two- to three-hour briefing late on a Friday afternoon. Um, at this point, I can assure you that the EPA technical staff, the career staff, are working hand-in-hand -hand with Department of Transportation. Um, before we go final with any with any final regulation on on the cafe proposal, um, they're meeting on a regular basis, um, several times a week, sharing information, sharing data, and I assure you that the, the final regulation, which is which I've overseen as the EPA administrator, um, has the full input of the EPA technical staff. 
So can you assure us that the problems identified by EPA staff about deficiencies in DOT's proposed modeling will be addressed in the final rule? We certainly um, in plan to have a final rule that both the technical staff and career staff at EPA and DOT um, will fully embrace and, and are, are stand behind. That is our intention. Now, I also want to mention that there have been reports that the auto industry doesn't support how the administration is proceeding. As they never asked for the standards to be flatlined, can you name a single company that prefers the proposal over an approach where the federal government works collaboratively with states like New York and California to write a reasonable rule that gives consumers and industry certainty and avoids needlessly, needless litigation. Well, I, I can say that the, the auto companies certainly came to the administration before I joined the administration asking for relief from the Obama um, CAFE standards. I, I, we've been working closely with them. They've all filed comments during the notice and comment period on the regulation. We're taking a look at those comments, and our goal is to have a regulation, a CAFE standard that all 50 states can support, as well as the industry and the environmental organizations as well. But we are certainly taking their views into account, and we hope to have a regulation that they can all feel comfortable and can achieve. But right now, most, most of the companies are not currently achieving even this year's Obama standards. Um, they're paying penalties and they're cashing in credits that they've built up instead of meeting the actual um, CAFE standards of today. Let me just say I appreciate the chair's indul indulgence. Well, if you'd yield for a minute. Yes. On, on this topic, if, if, if you'd yield yes. for a second. So I just I just want a little clarity because I think there's there's a couple pieces to this this conversation. Um, one is the standards. The other one is, is enforcement. Um, the um, President Trump's budget, and I quote from it, says the EPA will continue to ensure clean and safe air levels while providing certainty and flexibility to regulated community. The agency will continue to perform its compliance oversight functions on priority matters where there is evidence to suggest noncompliance. Now, the EPA's discovery of the Fiat Chrysler's use of uh, you know, defective devices in its diesel vehicles in 2015 and 16 was the result of EPA spot checking the vehicles to ensure there was compliance in the wake of the VW uh, scandal. Prior to the testing, EPA had no evidence that Fiat Chrysler was using um, defective devices in its, uh, in its diesel vehicles. So as you're going through talking about CAFE standards, uh, regulations, and, and that working with the states, um, the, the, the policies that the Trump administration is putting forward would have not have caught the Chrysler admission cheating. And I don't think that's a good idea. So what are you going to put uh, in to assure Ms. Lowey and others that um, this rulemaking that you're looking at is going to uh, not be reactive but proactive? Because if we don't even know there's something wrong, we can't even react to it. Well, we are. Thank you. Thank you. In the, in the enforcement program under our system administrator, Susan Bodine's leadership, we're moving away from focusing on entire industry sectors and instead looking at outcomes. For example, non-attainment areas, impaired waters. We're looking to see what we can do to bring those non-attainment areas to attainment through enforcement actions. Um, the, the Fiat Chrysler work, I have to absolutely applaud the, the career staff in Ann Arbor. They, um, were, they approached Fiat Chrysler, who assured them that they were not um, did not have a defeat device, um, but our staff believed that they did, and they literally combed through the computer programs um, and the code, which for the Fiat Chrysler for the for the trucks had over, I believe it was over 20, 20 million lines of code, which is like twice the amount of code that you find in a in a jet. Um, and so our our career staff found where um, the defeat device was located within the, the computer codes. We will continue to do work like that. And we've had other enforcement actions to, to, um, against other auto companies since then, um, both um, civil, um, as, as, and we're moving forward. We have other cases in the works. We're making sure that when people are not playing by the rules and they are um, creating more pollution by not following the, the, the standards as required under the regulations that we will catch them and we will hold them accountable to make sure that the, the pollution is reduced. 
Um, and again, I commend our career staff in Ann Arbor for finding that. Well, unfortunately, I have to leave, so I will leave the questioning to our um, distinguished chair. But I do hope that you will work collaboratively with states like New York, California, to write a reasonable rule that gives consumers and industry certainty and avoids needless litigation. And thank you very much, and I'm sorry. Thank you. Well, thank you, and I think the key word here is we need enforcement because we need to trust but verify. Uh, Mr. Uh, Joyce. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> As I mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, the subcommittee and the chair and I in particular recognize the important role that the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative plays in the ability to protect and preserve the Great Lakes ecosystem and the 24 million Americans who depend upon it. We have seen firsthand uh, that providing resources to restore the health of this ecosystem directly impacts the health of our economy. Since 2010, a total of 70 beneficial use impairments at 24 areas of concern in the Great Lakes State have been removed. This is seven times the number of BUIs removed in the preceding 22 years, including two BUIs in fiscal year 2018 in northeastern Ohio at the Cuyahoga and Ashtabula Rivers. It is because of the continued success stories like this why we, year after year this subcommittee has consistently, on a bipartisan basis, rejected proposed cuts to the GLRI from both current and previous administrations. Administrator Wheeler, could you take a moment to speak to the importance of the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative in improving the quality of the Great Lakes ecosystem and the health of the citizens who live in this region? A absolutely, Congressman. You know, I've, I've made this statement at a number of public forums and nobody has corrected me so far, so I'll continue to make it until somebody corrects me. I believe I am the only EPA administrator in the history of the agency to go swimming in the Great Lakes. Um, I, I'm from Ohio, as you know. Yes. I went to school in Cleveland. Um, I, I fully, um, I, I'm, I love the Great Lakes, and you know, I completely agree with President Trump last week when when he um, announced that we will fully fund the Great Lakes Initiative. Um, I've visited um, as the EPA administrator the, the Great Lakes area um, in Michigan, um, and we're doing some tremendous work there, um, working with the Michigan DEQ. I've, I've seen where the governor of Ohio has announced a large initiative to help the Great Lakes from the Lake Erie side. When I was at the G7 Environmental Ministers meeting last September in um, Halifax, I had a bilateral with uh, Minister McKenna from Canada, and um, she and I talked about what we can do jointly to help improve the quality and the health of the Great Lakes. And she and I intend to have um, to visit the Great Lakes together. We're looking at where we can visit both in the U.S. and in Canada on the same day to, to see some of the, the initiatives that we're doing to clean up the Great Lakes. But this is something that we take very seriously, I take very seriously, the President takes very seriously, and we're working to see how we can continue the, the progress that we've made with the Great Lakes. Well, God bless somebody who also has cherishes childhood memories of spending a two-week vacation swimming in Lake Erie in uh, the late 60s, early 70s. I'm amazed they still have any hair and uh, we've come a long way since those days with the restoration yes. initiatives and the efforts that we've done. But based on what you've mentioned, in light of the president's comments in Michigan last week, what is the administration's desired uh, fiscal year 2020 request for the uh, GLRI? Um, the, the actual dollar amount, I believe, is, is, is 300. Um, and it's my understanding we've been talking to OMB over the last couple of days about s submitting an additional request to, to Congress to, to cover that amount. So it's safe to say we're likely to see an addendum uh, I, from the administration noting the change and indicating where this $270 yes, million dollars will come from? We're certainly going to follow the president's direction on that, and we're, and we're working with OMB on, on the number and how we ask for that. Okay, knowing that we have many members here in, in a tight schedule, I yield back. Thank you. The ice cutters just were in Lake Superior. It's a little too cold to go swimming there right now. Um, <laughs> Mr. Kilmer. Thanks, Madam Chair, and thanks uh, for being with us. Um, so I represent a district in the state of Washington that's already seeing the impacts of climate change. We've seen catastrophic wildfires. We have people who work in our fisheries and shellfish aquaculture that are seeing changing ocean chemistry affect their livelihoods. Uh, we are seeing coastal communities dealing with rising uh, sea levels that present an existential threat to those communities. This isn't a hypothetical threat. It's a reality that we are facing in my state and in my district, and I'm really concerned uh, because um, not only 
have we received seven pages of testimony from you that doesn't mention climate at all? Not only have pages related to climate, climate ad adaptation been removed from your agency's web page, uh, not only uh, did you go on Fox News and say, I don't see climate change as an existential threat, it would be bad enough if your agency was just ignoring the problem. It's worse than that because you're actually t taking steps that move us in the wrong direction. Uh, as with other toxic pollution, pollutants, your administration has not only failed to develop regulations to protect public health and environmental quality, you're actually systematically dismantling key regulations like the Clean Power Plan and auto efficiency, uh, auto fuel standards that were putting us on the right track. So my question is, are you willing to come and meet the folks I represent who not only recognize that climate change is real, but who are actually dealing with these threats today so you can hear firsthand about the dangerous consequences your policies have had? Question. Congressman, I'm happy to, to visit with your constituents. I, I do want to say we did not dismantle the Clean Power Plan. The Supreme Court issued an historic stay um, on the Clean Power Plan and why we're going forward with our ACE regulation. Um, our ACE regulation will reduce CO2 emissions 34 percent below 2005 levels once it's fully implemented from the electric power sector. We also are reducing CO2 through our CAFE standards. Our CO2, um, our calculations for the CO2 emissions from our CAFE are pretty much in line with what the Obama administration would have achieved under their proposal. We have fewer ex ex exemptions under our proposal than the Obama administration did. Even though we flatlined it, they gave a lot of extra credits for um, different programs like electric vehicles that we do not include, which will actually end up having around the same level of CO2 reductions from the CAFE standard. We are implementing the Clean Air Act as Congress passed to reduce CO2, we take it seriously, I take it seriously, and we're moving forward under both the ACE proposal, which we hope to finalize in the next couple of months. We're following the Clean Air Act and, this, and the court's decisions in order to come draft the ACE proposal. We believe it will, be held, it will be upheld in court so that we will have a regulation that actually will take effect to reduce CO2 emissions from the electric power sector. So let me switch gears. You've said that you see water quality as the greatest environmental threat facing our nation, and I agree that your agency has a major role to play in addressing that count, uh, challenge. Uh, because I see how water quality is negatively impacting my region's most important body of water, Puget Sound, uh, as well as the iconic species like oysters and salmon and orca that depend on a healthy sound. But again, actions speak louder than words, and the fact is your actions aren't helping to address this challenge. You've presented a budget that pays lip service to improving water quality, but then cuts programs like the Puget Sound Geographic Program and the Nas National Estuary Program and categorical grants to combat non-point source pollution, which all directly support water quality improvement efforts. You've also rolled back existing water, water quality standards and failed to take action to regulate new toxic chemicals like PFAS. And perhaps most alarmingly, you fail to recognize the clear link between climate change and water quality issues. We've already seen how the increasing frequency of, wet, of severe wet weather events is causing more toxic stormwater and combined sewer overflows to pollute our environment and, connect, and contaminate drinking water uh, at unprecedented rates. And climate models predict that these conditions will only become worth, worse. So my second question to you is, how do you realistically intend to address the very real water quality challenges facing our nation without funding them and without addressing the underlying effects of climate change? First of all, we will implement the, the budget that the Congress appropriates for us. But our budget is um, geared to returning the agency back to its core mission to fulfill the, the, the clean air, clean water, um, re the contamination removal of, our, of the solid waste sites around the country and I believe that it will do that. We, the, most of the, um, the programs that are eliminating the budget are on the voluntary side, but we can make up for some of those. Um, for example, on the Chesapeake Bay, the WIFIA program grant that we gave on Baltimore will go a long way to helping clear up, um, clean up the Chesapeake Bay. We instituted a, a few, uh, actually a month and a half ago, um, a, a new memorandum to work with farmers to provide some market-based mechanisms to help farmers on the nutrients that are, that are causing problems in a number of estuaries like the Puget Sound estuary. So we're trying to work more cooperatively with regulated communities like agriculture and farmers to clean up the water that, that they run off, the nutrients that are going into water systems like that. On the, on the um, ocean plastics issue, 
where we have our trash free waters program that will help with um, reducing the plastic loads that are going into the oceans which are impacting the west coast um, those are for the most part waste that are coming from six asian countries so we're trying to work internationally cooperatively to try to help clean up the, the um, ocean plastic waste debris i'm working with our counterparts at the state department and usaid and some of the um, funding that they have as well so we're trying to we're trying to be very creative in what we do with the budget, but in, in this, in, in today's world where we're trying to tighten our belts across the across the board at the with the federal government, we're trying to see what we can do through our existing programs to address the environmental problems. And I think we can address problems like what we see in Puget Sound and some of the other estuaries around the country, um, not with the the program dollars geared specifically for those estuaries, but through our over um, our overarching programs under the Water Office. And, other, and, and our other agency offices across the board where we can make improvements in the environment and make sure that we are cleaning up all the estuaries, including Puget Sound. I know in Puget Sound we're working cooperatively with the tribes in that area, and EPA has been reaching out to them. Our Region um, 10 Regional Administrator has had a number of meetings. When I was in Seattle, I sat down with the tribal leaders um, from seven or eight different tribes um, to talk about what we can do cooperatively with them to clean up Puget Sound and other water bodies. And there's several of the tribes around the Puget Sound that I met with that day. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank, I yield you, back. thank you, Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer and I come from the both north, as you know, and the Canadians just released their Canadian Changing Climate Report this Monday. Uh, and uh, Canada is warming at twice the rate of the rest of the world. Northern Canada is warming even quicker, three times at the global rate. So those of us on the, from the bold north are very concerned about this issue, and I thank the gentleman for raising it. Uh, Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Madam Chair. Administrator Wheeler, thank you for being with us. You as well, Ms. Greaves. Um, I see the folder that you have before you, and there's 8,000 questions in there, potential questions that you have to be prepared to, to do and assist on with the administrator. And I, I imagine these hearings are, I don't know if they're stressful for you, but they certainly take a little, a little of your attention, and I imagine a lot of preparation. So thank you for being here. Um, I appreciate your tone, Administrator. You know, I'm one, of, I'm one who believes that if we could have a discussion on many of these issues um, that wasn't as politicized as they are, <clears throat> which is unfortunate and frankly sometimes accusatory. I've been told several times, you know, someone says, well, you're a Republican, you don't care about clean water, you don't care about clean air. Well, I just think that's nuts. So what an intellectually lazy way to start a conversation. Uh, to assume that one member of one party doesn't care about these issues. Of course we do. Uh, I live in the West. I love the West. And, uh, and I think as a father and a grandfather now, we, everyone wants to preserve these things, and we, I, I believe you do as well. Um, you know, you, in your opening comments, you had a chance to refer to a couple things, but there's some other things I want to thank you for. I, I want to emphasize the deregulation. Uh, we can have a balance of protecting these core values of water, air, environment, and still make it, you know, a, a business-friendly environment as possible. And I think we're seeing that reflected in some of, the, some of the strength of the economy, but some of the deregulation you've done is very important. But at the same time, your, your, uh, your commitment to the lead and drinking water, for example, your, your water infrastructure initiatives. I mean, I just kind of, you know, going through the pages here, state revolving funds. Uh, contaminated land cleanup. An important one for me is the reduction in the permit application backlog, uh, particularly for the West, which leads me now to my question. And I know these are a little bit geocentric, which is why, again, I, I don't know how you prepare for all these potential questions, but it has to do with refineries in Utah, all of, all of them, which are uh, classified as small refineries. And we have this interesting reality in Utah that we provide much of the refined petroleum for a lot of the inner mountain west. Um, in, the, in the past, in 2017, EPA granted 33 of 35 small refinery exemption petitions. In 2018, I know that was before your, your time, although you were, I, I think, overlapped with your, with your assistant as a deputy administrator, we didn't, ref, we didn't approve any of them in 2018. At least that's my understanding. Um, six months is the, is the so what some of them have been waiting, 90 days is what you, your own regulations allow to grant that. Give, give me some good news on these 
the small refinery exemptions for renewable fuel standards, if you would. Certainly, and as, as you can imagine, I, I get a lot of questions about the RFS program from a number of different members of Congress on, on both sides of the issue. On the small refinery exemptions, we are moving forward as the, um, as the statute um, directs us. EPA actually, um, prior, prior to my taking over the agency, had been sued three times and lost three times on the small refinery program. So we are implementing the program according to the, the, um, the court decisions as well as the statute, as well as appropriations language that we've received in the past. Um, as far as the 2018... Let me ask you just for clarity. Do you view those court decisions and the appropriations language as being in conflict, or do you think that they're in concert? There's no, no there's those nothing, are in concert. There's nothing there that would preclude one precludes the other, true? True. Yeah, okay. Um, as far as the 2018 applications, we've not received the official applications from the Department of Energy yet. The way the program works is the small refineries apply to the Department of Energy. They conduct their analysis. Um, they have sent us a list of the... Um, refineries that are, have requested a small refinery exemption, um, but they've not sent the actual applications over. We are expecting those any day now, probably okay. the next couple so, of weeks. So I need we to... We will process those on a, on a timely basis. So if we want to accelerate this, we need to talk to DOE, not you. Is that true? Um, I'm not sure how long DOE had them before they, they processed them themselves. Uh, most uh, small refineries wait until after the next year's RVOs are published, which was in November, before they apply. Let, let me ask you this. Let's assume that, that what you just said is true, and I hope that is, that DOE sends those applications over to you, I think you said, any day or shortly. Mm -hmm. Do you, will you be able to comply with a 90 day, uh, your 90-day guidance and turn those around very quickly? And please, if you can't, please do. Uh, you know, so they, they've been waiting a long time now. It's very, very important for these small refineries. I, we will certainly try to comply within the 90 days. I, I will also point out that the, the same staff that works on those are also working on the, um, the E15 and the, um, and the um, rent price mechanism proposal that we hope to have published by June 1st. Um, we're also working on the RVOs that are due this fall. Um, this administration was the first administration first time in the EPA's history to, to publish the RVOs um, two years in a row on time. Yeah. Um, we want to try to do that to provide certainty for the entire, um, for, for all, both the ethanol side and the refiners. Um, and we're also working on a reset, and also there's a court remand. So there's there's five or six competing priorities, but we'll certainly try to get them. If we get all, th I believe there's 30-some, um, if we get all 39 on one day, it may be hard to process all of them within 90 days, but we will do it on a rolling basis. Yeah. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Mr. Serrano. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Mr. Administrator, you recently replaced all seven members of the EPA Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee that advises the EPA on national air quality standards. You, a former coal industry lobbyist, appointed four state agency members that work under Republican governors the committee chair is an industry consultant. There is no one with the expertise on public health. The committee disbanded all scientific experts on particular matter and also on this stance in direct contravention of congressional intent. This morning, Dr. Bernard Goldstein, former chairman of the committee and EPA assistant administrator under President Reagan, wrote an op-ed in the Post declaring he would resign in protest of your systematic undermining of scientific integrity and the wholesale giveaway to polluters and industry. How do you respond to this alarming article from Dr. Goldstein? I, I have to say I've not, I've not seen the article yet. It, that, does, that does concern me, though. I, I don't believe we've, we've done that on the, on the CASE Act. Um, I didn't hand select any of the people on the CASE Act. They were recommended to me. By both um, by the career staff and the and the science advisory board office, um, and I believe we have a, a, a very good balance of talents on on KSAC. Um, I believe one person had to resign, who, who I believe was an epidemiologist, who we, we weren't able, um, or we we haven't yet replaced that person. If I'm remembering the right board, is either the science advisory board or the KSAC. Um, but the KSAC committee is 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 charged with um, reviewing our science on both the ozone and PM. Um, NACs, um, and I know they had a spirited, um, spirited conference call this past week. I'm looking forward to hearing the report. I understand there's a letter on it on its way to me from KSAC. I take that very seriously, 
and um, I look forward to working with them going forward. I will certainly read the article that you mentioned, but I've, I've not seen that article yet. Okay. <clears throat> I would imagine that someone like Dr. Goldstein would get his uh, desire to write what he wrote based on a lot of the things that I mentioned are happening. Uh, when do you see filling that position that is so important that you said the person resigned? I, it's, I believe it was... I have to get back to you on the timing on, on a replacement um, for that person. How do you justify the appointment of all the members of the committee and their subsequent actions in removing all qualified scientists from the odd zone and particular standards panel? You're talking about the sub-panels? Yes. Um, so under the Clean Air Act, the EPA is required to update the NACs every five years to conduct the review. What we found when we reviewed the process that we had in place, the subcommittees, by the way, are not required under the statute and they were not contemplated in the 1990 amendments. Um, what, when we looked at the current process, the current process took more than five years and we we're required under the statute to review the both NACs um, within five year period. So what we did was streamline the process so that we can comply with the Clean Air Act and, and finish our review within five years. KSAC, and I, and I sat down with the head of KSAC um, last summer when he took over the KSAC and I told him if you need additional outside scientific expert um, opinions or advice, KSAC is free to, to seek that out and, and receive that additional advice from, from other scientists and they can still do that. But if we were to reinstitute the subcommittees, that would take us past the 2020 deadline under statute where we're supposed to revise um, the NACs for both PM and ozone. And we're committed to trying to get both of those done within the five-year time frame that the Clean Air Act envisions. And that would be the first time the agency's ever met the five-year deadline if we're able to do I'm that. going to give you an opportunity, sir, to, uh, to make a statement on your behalf. What would you tell people who see all the changes that I mentioned here and how your board was appointed in the committee and say, oh my God, we're just gonna go back and undo some fine work that we did in the past. How would you say, what would you say to them? I'd say that's not what we're doing at all. Our, the KSAC members and the members, members of the Science Advisory Board were selected in, in large part for geographic diversity, geographic of, um, diversity of, 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 of viewpoints and backgrounds. Um, I would also point out um, on the on the one NAX for the for the um, for the PM under the Obama administration, a lot of people asked us to revisit that and to repeal that standard. We did not do that. We kept that in place, um, and we're taking the review of both the PM and the ozone NAX very seriously. Um, again, we want to try to get that completed within five years. This is what the American people deserve. Um, prior NAX reviews took six, seven, eight, even ten years at one point. Um, and I don't think that's fair to the American public to wait that long to review the NACs each time. Um, after we're finished with the five-year review at the end of 2020, we will start the next five-year review. This is supposed to be on a rolling basis so that we're constantly reviewing and the updated science that we receive and we take the advice and opinions from the KSAC members and from the public, because this, of course, go out for public comment before any final action on the NACs. My time is up, but let me just finish by telling you that uh, you should take seriously the concerns that exist not only among members of Congress, but amongst the public, that there are people in the administration uh, to undo EPA, to go back in time, to bring us back to the bad days. And, and you should take that not just as a comment, but something that you should look at if you care about the work you're doing. Thank you. I do, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we go to so Mr. Amade, uh, there's a lot of uh, abbreviations that are used when we have committee hearings. And um, I would, I've been trying to do this myself and questions I have before I refer to the alphabet abbreviation. I'm going to say what the whole um, title of the program is. And so for, for reference, uh, KSAC is a Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. So I would ask members um, the first time you refer to, uh, or Mr. Wheeler, the first time you refer to a program, we're using an abbreviation to please um, state the full name of the program so that anybody who's participating knows exactly what we're talking about and it doesn't sound like insider um, baseball because it's baseball season now. Mr. Amade.
he's working on a really great question. I just know it. Um, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mr. Ritter, thank you for being here. Uh, a few minutes ago, sir, you mentioned that uh, the EPA will implement the budget it gets. It was something like that? Yes, sir. Mr. Wheeler, all EPA offices have lost engineers and scientists that have not been replaced. Region 5, my region. Uh, I began my professional career in air programs at Region 5. Region 5 has lost over 120 engineers and scientists since 2017 to attrition and retirement. The EPA has not spent the $3 million it had in FY18 to hire replacement staff that the region had available in the environmental program and management account. Why did each region not spend down the accounts designated for staff salaries and expenses when management knew the regions were desperately in need of staff in 2018? Sir, as of April 2nd, 2019, Region 5 has not replaced even 20% of the staff it lost in FY 2018. What steps will you take up to speed up the hiring in each region? Because you, you, honestly, you can't say you're going to implement the budget if you have it and we're not. Well, Congressman, I, I will tell you that we are trying, that we have um, some serious workforce challenges at the agency at this point. Um, we went several years without a permanent human resource director. We just hired a new person who started less than a month ago. Um, I actually interviewed her before before we hired her, even though I'm told that an administrator doesn't typically hire, doesn't typically interview the human resources person that's two or three levels below. But I knew that there was important challenges that we face, and I wanted to make sure we had a great human resources director. Forty percent of our agency workforce is eligible to retire over the next five years. Um, we are trying to hire up, but we are also losing people at a very fast rate. Um, the TOSCA program, which is one number I, I, I know off the top of my head, last year in 2018, we hired 30 new staff to work on the new TOSCA legislation. Well, we don't have time. We lost today 30 people last year in that program as well. So we're hiring people as fast as we're losing people. What I would like, we're, trying, we're trying to address this. We don't have, and I, and I respect your opportunity to respond. I think it would be better is if you could, in writing, if, if the chairman would, would have it, uh, if you could detail exactly what you're doing to recruit, the, the numbers that you're interviewing, and exactly what your approach is to go out and hire folks, um, aside from the fact that perhaps th they're concerned about the policies of the EPA, there shouldn't be other reasons why folks don't want to do this. Uh, let me shift to Brownfields. Uh, uh, it's easy to tire of the agency talking about what it cares about, and then in reality, it does something entirely different. It has repeatedly stated that Superfund cleanups are at a priority, but the administration's budget cut for all types of cleanups total $116 million, or 15 percent. Doesn't this, again, seem contradictory? Well, under our enforcement program, we're going after more aggressively potential responsible parties to make sure that they are paying for the cleanups at the Superfund sites. Um, part of what we're doing is using our, our, our resources um, more effectively, I believe. Um, we're speeding up cleanups. We're bringing parties together, working out the differences. Um, the, on the East Chicago um, Superfund site, we've, we've speeded up the cleanup of that site, which will, uh, which will improve um, lead contamination in yards where children are currently playing. Um, we did the same thing for a lead smelter site in Colorado. It was, it, was, it was projected to take eight to 10 years to get it cleaned up. Um, I personally got involved in that site last year, and we're now on a three to four year time frame of freeing that site. And again, up. sir, uh, given our, our, such a short time frame today, if you could detail in writing the number of investigations, quantify to the extent you possibly can exactly what the agency is doing on brownfields and how it's moving forward much more aggressively. I mean, I got to ask, I, Willowbrook, Illinois, is not in my district. It's my, uh, my colleague's district. Given the threat risk that was involved there, why did it take the state EPA to shut that place down and not the U.S. EPA? We, we have been monitoring the air, working with the community groups, working with the state, giving them a lot of the data that they used um, when we take an action like that, we have to make sure that it can be upheld in court. 
Um, we are working aggressively on a new regulation that will address the emissions of the ethylene oxide from facilities like um, like Willow Willow Brook, um, and we're, we are we are moving forward very aggressively. We did um, ambient air monitoring from November until March. We're now doing um, dispersion um, modeling to to determine what type of regulation we need to protect the people there. But we have provided. Um, assistance. We've been on the ground. We've had EPA personnel there. We've had the EPA monitors there. The, the state of Illinois has relied upon us for a lot of the technical assistance and a lot of the work. Well, and, and, and I apologize, used. sir. My time is up. Uh, just as you know, in 2016, they found ethylene oxide to be 30 times more carcinogenic than previously suspected. Your monitoring show when they shut it down, the numbers went down dramatically. The cancer risks were extraordinary, and you still let IEPA do the heavy work. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Quigley. Um, I'm going to have a question on staffing later, and we'll work with, with your office to make sure that um, we do a robust um, question um, to the EPA to address your issues on this. And uh, it's also my understanding, Mr. Quigley, that the EPA set regional targets, full-time uh, targets, lower than what Congress had directed. So that's going to be one of the things we're going to ask you to look into. Um, Ms. Wat uh, Ms. Watzerman Coleman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, uh, Secretary Wheeler. Um, Administrator Wheeler, one of the most critical recent public health regulations has been the mercury and air toxic standards which prevent an estimated 11,000 premature deaths, 130,000 asthma attacks, and 4,700 heart attacks each year. Yet, my understanding is you are now proposing to eliminate the foundation of that rule, making it more vulnerable to legal challenge. Can you assure this subcommittee that any change to the appropriate and necessary standard will not result in the courts overturning the rule? It seems from your proposal that you want to ignore the tremendous public health benefits of the rule. Where 68 percent of uh, African Americans live in, within 30 miles of a coal-fired power plant and 40 percent of Latinos do. So the harms from abandoning this rule would disproportionately affect these minorities. Will the EPA consider the public health impacts and the effects on minority communities of losing the MATS rule before finalizing that rule? And will it make that analysis publicly available? Thank you, Congresswoman. Um, on the MATS regulations, we had a Supreme Court case that told us, that directed us to go back and look at the cost benefit analysis and the rationale behind the regulation, which is what we've done. And that's what we did in our proposal. At the same time in our proposal, we also did the, the technology review, which is also required. We believe by doing both the appropriate necessary um, review that the Supreme Court directed us to do and the technology review at the same time will ensure that the technologies that have already been deployed at the power plants around the country will remain deployed, will remain on, and will not be turned off. Most of, those, most of the equipment that has been installed not only reduces mercury, but also reduces other pollutants as well. So yes. even if it were to be turned off for mercury, it would still be turned back on again for the other pollutants. So at the end of the day, we do not believe, and our analysis shows, that we do, we do not believe that any mercury control equipment will be turned off anywhere in any of the plants around the country. Um, that is a regulation, you know, it's, Thank you. it's, it's already been implemented. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. So does that mean that the sort of, um, not ancillary, but co-benefits, the health benefits, um, will cont continue to have the same kind of weight in this consideration as to what should be allowed and what shouldn't be allowed? Well, that is what the Supreme Court um, pointed to in their, in their decision. Well, that's what I'm asking was, you. But the Supreme Court took issue with the co-benefits um, justification of the, of the Obama regulation. So we are um, justifying the regulation um, in, in, in so large by, part by the technology. Thank regime. you, sir. Um, so by not or not feeling obligated to consider those sort of health benefits, the impact on asthma, the impact on heart attacks, the impact on um, other, other, other such issues um, could conceivably make these populations, particularly those that live in proximity, um, more vulnerable. If you all agree 
that these co-benefits um, aren't necessary or too rigorous? Well, well, again, the, the equipment won't be turned off, so the, so the air quality will not be will not be decreased at all. Um, but the co-benefits go to particulate matter, and we right. have other regulations that address particulate matter, and we're in the middle of the, mm -hmm. the NACS PM review right now as we speak. Yeah. I'm really interested in this particular issue because I understand it, that the major, much, much of the coal power industry supports this rule as it is, um, including those that are the Edison Electric Institute, the American Public Power Association, IBEW, LIUNA, Senators Mansion, Hitilis, Carper, and Susan Collins, the American Lug Association, and the Sierra Club. In other words, basically everyone across the political uh, ideological spectrum. Except the Supreme Court. And opposing the rule, however, we have one uh, person who stands out, and that's Bob Murray, who happens to be your former uh, client and a major donor to the your boss who has sued to block the rule. Have you considered recusing yourself from the discussion and the evolution of this rule change? Well, first of all, I, I take my recusals very seriously. I'm recused from working with any of my former clients or having any conversations with my former clients about any EPA. So then it, you're telling me, yes, you are recusing yourself in this instance. Well, I'm, I'm allowed to work on... Um, on rules and regulations of general applicability, mm. which this is considered. Mm. I did so not lobby on this. Do you this see regime. the possibilities of this looking as if there's a conflict of interest uh, with regard to the benefit to Mr. Murray, or do you see it as a possibility of just undermining future environmental regulations? I, I have taken my recusals very seriously. I've, I've worked with our career ethics officials. I, you know, I, I, th I thank you. I thank you. Um, I have to tell you that you do talk a very positive game, but for me, uh, actions speak much louder than words. I just want to say um, just a few, a few things about the Healthy Schools Grant Program, which is a new program, is there's a $50 million um, appropriation recommended by you. And it says that this somehow will um, mitigate some of the asthma triggers. I wanted to know how. By reducing some of the the pollution that we we find in schools, what what in the I, school I, in the mm -hmm. schools. Um, so this, you know, there's a number okay. of different environmental issues with particularly the older schools, okay. um, and so a lot of the older schools are in in poor communities and rural communities. So thank you, try thank you, Mr. Wheeler. I love I talking that. about that program. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. For, for, the, for the record, and I'm Ms. Wasserman's call, if you have, it might be a different letter that you were referring to, but I think you were referring to possibly a letter addressed on March 26, 2019, to the Honorable William A. Weithram, Assistant Administrator of the Office of Air and Radiation. And from reading through this, it's, it was just strictly about regulation. It wasn't about the Supreme Court ruling on using uh, health care cost of ben benefit analysis, and they wanted to see the rule as currently written stay in place. So without any objection, I will enter this into the record. And if you have something else you'd like to enter, um, we can do that too. Without any objection? You want to see it a letter? You can, you can, of course you can review it. We'll get back to it later. Um, and and while, we're, while you're looking at it, um, um, we're, we don't have any uh, further questions from any new Republican members unless they walk in. So I'm going to go through with the questions um, from Ms. Lawrence and Ms. Pingree, myself, and then uh, we will return to you, Mr. Joyce. Uh, Ms. Lawrence. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Weaver, for being here today. The EPA is charged with protecting our health and the environment now more than ever. This administration we need a strong administration that believes in this, in this mission. EPA should be overseeing programs that save our communities from harm, but this budget does not reflect that. This administration's priorities, in my opinion, does not um, do that. I, have, I wanted to follow up on the appropriated funds uh, which have not been dispensed. I've been an advocate of three drinking water programs authorized in 2016 under the WIN Act, assistance for small disadvantaged community communities, reducing lead in drinking water and lead testing in schools. 
Since 2016, Congress has appropriated funding, but the money has not gone out the door. Ms. Holly, you might want to weigh in on this. There's millions in drinking water infrastructure funding that's just sitting around. Can you please explain what's EPA's plan for these funds, and do you plan to dis to dispute uh, to uh, to uh, ensure that these funds are distributed in our communities? Yes, and I and I might actually refer to my, my CFO in a minute. Um, it's it's my understanding the coming weeks we will be announcing the details and the allocations for the small and disadvantaged communities grant and the allocations for the lead testing in schools grant. Um, and we have also requested $10 million for the lead testing in schools grant for the 2020 budget. So we are moving forward on these programs. Um, as, you, as you noted, these are new programs, um, so it's a little slower in getting them off the ground. But we, we, are, we anticipate announcing the details and the allocations for both of those grants in the next few weeks. My next question is about we only have one pot of money, and your budget creates a new healthy schools program that asks for $50 million. We already have bipartisan programs in place that assist children in schools with contamination, infrastructure, and health. Why are you creating a new program when you could just keep the programs fund them, implement them that we already have? With this $50 million, you're taking away it averages out about a dollar per child in other programs. Well, part, part of what we discovered, what I discovered in, in looking at our existing school programs across the board was that they were disjointed. We had a program in our, on our Tosca office on PCBs and on windowsills, for example. Our air office has a, has a great program on healthy air in schools. We also have um, programs on the, on the lead pipes and the drinking water for schools. But what we weren't doing was coordinating all of that into one program. And what this $50 million um, re request is, is to try to have that bridge for where we take all of our separate school programs together so we can provide grants to schools to look at the environment holistically. So that if you have a school that's doing some remodeling, for example, that they look at all the different aspects of how to clean up the school to comply with the different requirements and the different programs we have. So it's not... Um, it's it's not taking away from the existing programs. It's trying to create the overarching program that will bring in all of the disparate school children programs. I mean, literally, at one of my senior staff meetings, when I brought up a children's health issue, one of my other AAs said, well, you know, we do this, and another one said, well, we do that. And we realized that there was not good coordination across the agency. The agency historically has been fairly siloed between the air program, the water program, the toxics program, the land. Thank program. you. I, I just want to state that the frustration I have, um, m many, but one is that it's so much focus on dismantling the previous administration programs that if we move forward with them, we would actually be making a difference. However, there's a majority of this administration's time is spent on dismantling anything that is related to the previous administration. You keep saying, we're going to, we're going to. We're, we're going into our third year of this administration where you, are, you have spent almost two solid years dismantling where we have suffered as a result of that. Um, we'll be, our eyes will be on you to see if you actually implement the new programs. How close are you to listing the PFAS as a hazardous substance, and what is preventing you from moving more quickly? Congress has asked you to list them. This makes contaminated areas eligible for the Superfund program. Uh, with the hazardous, we, we just started the process on listing as a hazardous substance under Superfund, but we are looking at PFAS, PFOA under all of our different statutes and all of our authorities. Um, we're looking to add it to our TRI reporting system. Um, we're moving forward on the on an MCL. When will you be able to list, make the list, sir? Um, we're just starting again on the hazardous substance side, so that is going to take a little bit of time. But what I want to reassure the public is that we are currently enforcing 
or 70 parts per trillion of drinking waters around the country. We've taken eight enforcement actions and we've assisted states in dozens of other enforcement actions. So where we find PFAS, PFOA, and it's a problem for the drinking water, we step in and we make sure that the water is cleaned up and that the Americans have clean, safe drinking water. So even though we're working on these other tools, we are still moving forward to enforce the, the current tools and working with our state partners um, across the board. One of your responsibilities is to advise this administration. I do hope that you could move from the point of working on it, projecting, and getting to it and start doing the job and advise this administration on the tools you need to be effective. Thank you. Thank you. On the, on the, on the standard that you're talking about for the P, PFAS, PO, uh, the Department of Defense has been widely reported in the media uh, is going to be looking for a lower standard. I serve as vice chair on the Defense Committee, and those of us on the Defense Committee that I've had informal discussions with would prefer the EPA to stand strong and tell the DOD we are not weakening standards for our military bases, for our military servicemen and women and their families who live on those bases. And uh, we will be writing the Department of Defense and, and uh, CCing you that, that letter. Mr. Simpson, welcome back from Energy and Water. Good to see you. Thanks. It's good to be here. My turn? Yes, it is. See, that's why I waited till it was my turn so I could just come in. <laughs> uh, Administrator Wheeler, uh, on this subcommittee, we have uh, questions, uh, questioned many uh, EPA administrators over the waters of the United States rule. It is no secret that Idahoans uh, are deeply concerned about this rule under the Obama administration. Can you please update the subcommittee on the progress being made to rewrite the rule that provides clarity to this rule? Uh, I'm sorry, the waters of the U.S.? Yes. Yes. Um, so we proposed our waters of the, of the U.S. Um, in December, and we're, we're, it's currently open for public comment. I believe the comment period closes in a couple of weeks on April, uh, that's right, on tax day. Ah. The comment period closes on April 15th. Um, and our, our intention is to try to finalize that regulation before the end of this year. Okay, thank you. Uh, in your testimony, you noted this uh, $700 billion backlog in water infrastructure. That's a backlog that seems to continually grow. Do you see an infrastructure package as uh, a place that is appropriate to address this issue? Uh, and along those same lines at the Department of Interior, I worked closely with Secretary Zinke and his team to develop a plan to address the backlog maintenance in our national parks and other public lands. It is a long-term vision. Does the EPA have a long-term plan to address the water infrastructure backlog in this country? We do, and we would certainly, um, administration certainly welcome working with Congress on a new infrastructure, um, infrastructure legislation, but we do have um, a, a plan in place we're using the SRFs as well as the, um, the new um, WIFIA program and then the new AWEA program that just passed at the end of last year. It wasn't funded for this year, but we've requested $83 million for AWEA. I, I will note, without the funding this year, we're probably going to miss the deadlines that were included in the new legislation. Um, but hopefully with funding next year, we'll be able to get back on track, and that's going to provide some important grant and loan opportunities for a number of small communities around the country. So we have three different, um, you know, both WIFIA and OWIA are new, um, but we're using the SRF as well. Do you have a plan where you could show me if we appropriate the amount of money that you've requested for these different programs, what that would do to the backlog maintenance, increase, decrease? Because uh, it just seems to grow no matter what we do. And when you talk about $700 billion backlog. Mm -hmm. Putting $83 million into it in a program really doesn't address it. And I know that there's more than just this one program that we put money into, but it seems to me like we need some type. And I, as when I was chairman of this committee, we had these discussions and we still have them and we'll probably have them for the next generation. What can we do to address this huge backlog maintenance that just continues to grow and grow and grow? And somehow we need an overall plan to try to address this. Uh, and it, it might be uh, several different programs that put together, or it might be an overall sort of program. Of, you know, I and mean, we're talking about here is revenue. How do you get the revenue to do it? Absent being um, appropriated seven hundred billion dollars, which I don't think is in probably not going to happen right now. Yeah. Um, you know, we we have with the, with the SRF, with the WIFIA, and with the, with the new AWEA, I think we have um, some really good tools to address this. 
On the SRF, it's important to note, even though the appropriations may seem small year to year, right now there's $80 billion circulating through the SRF program because right. as we loan out money, it gets repaid and we, re we reloan it out again. So there's $80 billion currently in the two SRF programs. The WIFIA program allows us to leverage private sector funding. We provide through WIFIA that last bit of financing that's hard for communities to, to, uh, to find in order to fund their projects. Um, I, I mentioned earlier um, that we just funded a new WIFIA loan program in Baltimore, and that's going to really help the Chesapeake Bay, for example. Um, and I'm, I'm going down to Florida at the end of this week for, uh, for a WIFIA signing for the city of Miami. Um, so, and these are programs where, you know, under WIFIA, um, you know, we, we put in a small amount of money, but it leverages up to 20, um, actually $4 billion, 11 billion total for 2018 is, is what is leveraged by that amount of money that we have in the appropriations for WIFIA. Okay. Uh, one question, I just have a few seconds left. States have the responsibility under the Clean Water Act to develop human health water quality criteria. As you are all aware, Idaho developed its own water quality standards and underwent a multi-year process that surveyed populations, including the tribes and their fish consumption rates. Can you please provide an update on where Idaho's standard is at the approval process? Um, Congressman, if I could get back to you on that, I'd be happy to provide it for you in writing. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pingree, you've been waiting very patiently on this very special day for you. Um, so, um, Would the general lady yield? Is my understanding that that is on behalf of the committee, we'd be remiss if we didn't wish you a happy birthday and many that's, more? That, that, that's totally correct. It is Ms. Pingree's birthday, and Mr. Joyce and I, in respect of our fondest wishes for you to have a happy birthday. We'll not sing you happy birthday, sure. but we yield to you for to do a It's a great relief. Thank you. And thank you for those kind wishes. And I must say that I can't think of anything I would prefer doing on my birthday than spending it with this committee and with you, Mr. Wheeler. So thank you very much for being with us. <laughs> Um, yes, thank you very much, uh, Administrator Wheeler, for being with us today, and um, also to you, Ms. Graves. It's um, it's it's been very interesting to hear my colleagues' concerns, and I just want to um, add my voice here. I think all of us are very frustrated with this administration, with the previous administrator, and and um, the EPA in general, uh, the budget cuts, the lack of investment in science, the consolidation of departments we don't think should be consolidated. There's, there's a long list, and many of my colleagues have already mentioned them. And, and overall, they seem to be uh, constantly pointing to a lack of regard for the challenges we're facing with climate change. Um, you had mentioned early on that in your opinion, economic growth and environmental con protection can go hand in hand. And um, we've given that a lot of thought in my state, the state of Maine, where uh, we're, we're very dependent on having a healthy environment. And there are high levels of concerns from my constituents and I believe people across the country. But um, we're, we're seeing it in our everyday lives. Um, sea level is rising. Our state is, you know, framed by the ocean, and the ocean in the Gulf of Maine is warming at a rate 95 or more percent faster than the rest of the world. And those temperatures have a huge impact on our fisheries. Ocean acidification, um, as my colleague Mr. Kilmer from the West Coast mentioned, um, is already having an impact. And um, these are big picture issues. These aren't things that, you know, one little program can correct. And it seems like that's where the EPA has the most disregard for the challenges that we're facing in the future. There's not a simple way uh, to cool down the ocean if we don't have regard for the polar ice cap melting, and there's not a simple way to deal with ocean acidification if we're not looking at these big picture issues. And with an administration that's pulled out of the Paris Accord and seems to have total disregard for even this topic, you yourself said it's not an existential threat. I don't know. I don't really always understand what existential means, but if this isn't an existential threat, I don't know what is. So um, I want to go back to a couple of more specific points, but just express my frustration and real anger at the lack of regard in the administration and in this budget. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about vehicle standards, and, and that is one of those places where I can't begin to understand the justification for rolling back um, the previous standards and going back on what the last administration did. Um, your own administration says that it will cost about 60,000 jobs, lead to 7 billion tons of pollution at a time 
when we are really trying to deal with this issue. Um, the way I look at it in my state, it's a very rural state, maybe one of the most in the country. People drive uh, pickup trucks and bigger cars. Um, and in fact, they're just going to have to buy a lot more gas. Um, the Rhodium Group did a study that shows that if we stick with the standards that are today and don't continue on this process, over time it's going to cost consumers 193 to $236 billion. Um, that's just real money out of people's pockets, and it appears to be done for the benefit of oil refiners. Um, there was reported in the New York Times last December um, that a real push had been made by Marathon Petroleum, um, as well as a conservative think tank, the Koch brothers, saying that um, these standards were a relic of um, a disproved narrative of resource scarcity. Well, I think there's general understanding that we have to reduce our dependence on oil and gas in this country. And while we may have somewhat of a boom going on right now, um, there are multiple reasons, including the quality of our air, um, that we should be moving ahead. Most scientists believe there's no way to decarbonize without um, taming these carbon emissions. And we're missing out on the technology when we don't have our auto companies um, moving forward with this, where everybody else in the world is with hybrid and electric vehicles. So I've actually taken up a lot of my time on my own diatribe here. But can you give me any justification why this is a good idea and why it benefits anybody but oil refiners or people selling these products? Why do we want to fall so far behind? Thank you, Congresswoman. First of all, um, and, and I think the point you made about what people in Maine like to drive is, is, is part, of the, part of the issue here. The the um, mid the mid evaluation the mid course evaluation that the Obama administration undertook they started it in November 2016 right after the election they went out for public comment and finished it by January 20th um, it, it, they did not review a lot of the data that we've been reviewing over the last two years as we move forward with with our cafe proposal one of the interesting facts that w that we've found is that the average age of cars on the road today has increased from, it used to be average of eight, now to 12 years. People are holding on to their cars longer because of the expense of the cars. We believe our proposal will reduce the price of a new car by $2,300. It will also Let me just interrupt here, though, but aren't you, I, I understand in the short run, but the more competition there is on fuel-efficient vehicles, the more we improve the technology, the more we have hybrid, I mean, we're going to pretty soon have an electric tuck. We're going to have an electric SUV. We're going to be much smarter about all this stuff. But in the end, if you keep people in non-fuel efficient cars, they're going to pay a lot more in gas. So maybe you're right in the short run, it's going to cost you a little bit less. But aren't you in the long run of the vehicle going to pay a lot more money in, in fuel? But, but rem remember, the standards are a floor. They're not a ceiling. We, we encourage the automobile industry to, to go as far as I think can, we all know that voluntary with, standards aren't going to help our com country keep up with the rest with of the world. Our standards wouldn't be voluntary. There'd be the floor. But a lot of car companies say that they can go further. But it, it depends on what the American consumer buys as well. Um, but, you know, we're looking not just at fuel efficiency with our standard. The, the Obama administration's proposal only looked at fuel efficiency or CO2. We're looking at both fuel efficiency as well as lives saved. I, I'm we out of time, and I'm thousand. dangerously out of time. But uh, my other question is, it, it, it appears that there wasn't a lot of consultant with the states. A lot of states want to reduce these standards, whether you do or not. Could you provide our committee with the records of the EPA and the NHTSA's meetings on your consultations with the states? Because I, I feel there wasn't enough done. Uh, certainly, we, we, can, we can provide that. I'll, I'll tell you, I personally met with Mary Nichols from California three times. I have to yield back, sorry. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Ms. Pingree. Mr. Joyce has had an opportunity to review the letter that I want to submit for the record, um, dated March 26, 2019, to the Honorable William L. Weirum, Assistant Administrator of the Office of Air and Radon, and without further objection, this letter will be uh, entered into the record. So moved. Um, I'm going to ask uh, some questions now. Um, I want to talk about what I view um, as a serious uh, issue when it comes to the integrity of, uh, of science and the programs at the EPA. Last week, Senator Udall and I sent you a letter about our concerns about regarding the EPA's management of the IRIS program. The IRIS program stands for the Integrated Risk Information System. Mm -hmm. And what I believe... Um, 
clearly as EPA um, uh, thumbing its nose at uh, congressional directives. Fiscal year 2019, Congress funded the IRIS program at the same level as the prior year and directed EPA to continue to do that work within EPA's Office of Research and Development. Instead, GAO recently found that IRIS staff had been pulled away from the critical chemical assessment work to support the Office of Pollution Prevention and, to and Toxics, TOSCA. Can you explain how the agency's actions comply with congressional directives on the IRIS program? Certainly, um, and, and thank you, Chair, for, for asking me that, because I, I do want to clear that up. Um, those people are still FTEs within ORD and the IRIS program. Um, we had, I believe, six um, IRIS staff that went on a short detail back in 2017 to the toxics program. They've since returned back to the IRIS program. We currently have two staff people, um, I believe one from IRIS and one from someplace else within ORD, who have gone on detail to the toxics program as well. This is part of our one EPA where it's important for people who are working on risk assessments under IRIS know how the risk assessments are being used under TSCA and the, and the way the different programs work and operate. They're still IRIS employees. They're on short details. They come back to the IRIS program, and I believe when they come back to the IRIS program, they have a better understanding of how the work that they're doing under IRIS will be used by the other program offices within the agency. Well, I, I, th I thank you for that, but then I think if you need to be doing that, you need to come and talk to Congress about moving um, individuals around even as, as short detailees well, there, because I there's, think every, work to, there's work to be done. There's work to be done in IRIS, and we want to make sure that um, that work gets done, and that in IRIS is considered uh, the gold standard. So um, if federal, federal I mean, employees take short details uh, across the board all the I, I understand time. that. I, I have detail. Yeah. I've had detailers yes. in my office. I think they're valuable experiences, but right now the EPA has been sitting on the IRIS program's assessment for uh, formaldehyde uh, for, for over a year. And um, uh, when, when the person left from IRIS, because they're, 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 you know, the formaldehyde assessment's important. It's important to industry. It's important to individuals. So when um, the, uh, you know, the, when, when, uh, when you remove someone from um, IRIS to go work on TSCA, did you fill the IRIS position with someone else from a detail, or does work just go undone? Because the GAO test has testified that the IRIS assessment's almost complete, but the last year the EPA's leadership decided to cut formaldehyde from the IRIS program, from its list of high chemicals, and then uh, a few weeks ago, formaldehyde was, uh, you know, designated as a high-priority uh, chemical under TSCA. So, um, you know, IRIS is considered the gold standard. Um, the work was moving to, to um, uh, do that under the IRIS program, and all of a sudden it's been moved to the TSCA program where you've moved IRIS employees to TSCA. So, Please explain to me not only the movement of employees, but the movement of, of, of formaldehyde from the gold standard to a lesser standard. Well, I don't believe TSCA is a lesser standard, first of all. But the employees that took the details, those were voluntary details. Nobody was reassigned. Um, people can apply for details um, throughout the agency, and that happens on a regular basis. I started my career as a career employee at the agency back in 1991. I took a detail to the Senate. Um, and back in 95. Um, but as far as formaldehyde goes, the, I mean, the IRIS program has been working on formaldehyde for 27 years. I, I don't think you can blame all the delays on that with this administration. But well, on formaldehyde, you know, the, I, the, the problem with just relying on an IRIS risk assessment is there's no regulatory program under IRIS. Um, but if we put IRIS, if we put formaldehyde through the TSCA program at the end of the assessment under TSCA, we can regulate how formaldehyde is used. I understand that. I understand what you're saying about the regulation, but I beg to differ with you. The IRIS program is a reviewed process program that's considered, as I said, to be the gold standard when it comes to assessing toxic, uh, toxicity, and it's in based on scientific literature and it's peer reviewed. Um, TSCA's review method um, is using, uh, right now, political appointees who don't necessarily use best scientific pra practices, and it's not peer-reviewed. So the standard under which 
um, the formaldehyde will be um, uh, reviewed um, is, is, uh, is, 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 is it's different. Um, so was formaldehyde removed from the TOSCA program's rigorous review process? And it has, it's been shifted uh, to, um, from IRIS to TOSCA. Um, where are the um, where are the the findings of toxicity um, going to be made to the public that uh, Iris was looking at? Is uh, we're going to is the public going to be able to look at exactly what Iris was finding with with formaldehyde now that's been uh, shifted over? Well, well the, the the information that the Iris program was working on uh, under uh, on formaldehyde will be shared with the TOSCA program and that will go into the underlying um, program the, the underlying um, risk assessment that the, the the TOSCA program undertakes to, to review formaldehyde but the, you know it was it was not removed from iris what we what we did last year um, under the iris program is you know the iris had a long list a laundry list a long laundry list of, of chemicals that were requested for assessments but what we discovered, and going back to the program offices that originally requested those assessments, that people didn't seem to know why they were requested or what the regulatory purpose was. So what we did last summer, and that was under, under my direction, was to um, have a new process where ORD, the IRIS team, reaches out to all the program offices and ask them to, to put forward the chemicals that they want to have an IRIS risk assessment conducted. And what we ended up having was basically a one-page form that would be signed by both the system administrator for whichever program office is requesting the, the risk assessment, as well as signed by the, the head of ORD to agree on the parameters for the risk assessments, how long the risk assessment would take, and what the purpose of the risk assessment was. Those requests went out to all the program offices. They came back. There were 11 or 12 high-priority chemicals that some of the program offices requested IRIS to, to initiate the risk assessments. None of the program offices actually requested formaldehyde under that process. So um, this is one reason why we went ahead and put formaldehyde through the TOSCA program because we knew of the interest of both Congress and the public in getting some answers on formaldehyde. Again, if we were to move forward with the formaldehyde risk assessment under IRIS, it's at least 18 months at a minimum away from being available to the public. Um, during that time, we could be moving forward with the TOSCA program, and at the end of the TOSCA program, if there are if there are toxicity concerns with the formaldehyde, we must regulate it and control it. So, if we were to do the IRIS program, you'd spend a couple of years. At the end of the day, you still wouldn't have started a regulatory program to deal with formaldehyde. Oh. By putting it in TOSCA today is going to allow us I, to regulate it much faster. I, I understand than doing the your IRIS logic. I understand your reasoning on it, but. Um, you know, we um, we uh, put funding into IRIS with the um, understanding that the congressional directive on IRIS would be followed, and that that's one concern. The other concern is by the IRIS program not being able to complete its full assessment on on formaldehyde, it would facilitate the TOSCA review process uh, for formaldehyde to um, be more more effective and more more efficient in protecting public health. So you, you've got a letter. We'll, we'll follow up on, on more of this, but okay. I just wanted you to um, hear it from me because I did send a letter. Um, we are very concerned that uh, IRIS move forward as congressionally directed. Another um, uh, a letter uh, that um, that we have uh, uh, sent uh, in February. Um, I wrote to you about Region 5's review of Minnesota's Pollution Control Agency permit to use uh, uh, and polymet mining last December. The process surrounding the EPA's review of that permit was unusual. And um, I so the heart of this goes to our EPA employees required to follow the Federal Records Act. Um, during your tenure at the agency, EPA officials have, have you ever directed them to conduct agency business verbally in order to prevent or limit the generation of written records? Absolutely not. Well, um, th this is why we wrote the letter, because the EPA staff in reviewing the permit uh, indicated to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency that they had serious reservations about the draft permit but they did not send the MPCA the written comments about their concerns. 
Is this the usual practice not to send, if, the, if these are serious reservations, serious reservations now, not to send them in writing, an email? What I've encouraged our regional administrators to do is to work more cooperatively with the states. And what our regional administrator undertook in Region 5 was what she calls action days, where instead of sending letters back and forth with the states on issues like permits, they sit down and they have a meeting face to face. Um, there's, we've, she's now done this, Region 5 has done this in three actions, um, two, one, one in Wisconsin and one in Ohio on a CAFO regulation and oversight, and then this was the third. And it's my understanding in talking to my regional administrator and in she talking to the career staff who participated in the action day with the state of, of Minnesota was that all the issues that were raised in the letter were raised in the meeting face to face with the state regulators and they resolved all the issues. Well, I raise these concerns because the uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency um, did have notes and they were made public through an open records request. Uh, the notes indicated that the career staff were preparing, EPA career staff were preparing written comments on the permit and had intended them to be transmitted to the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Did the EPA ever send the MPCA any written comments? It's my understanding no, because they reviewed all the comments and issues they had in the face-to-face -face meeting with the Minnesota staff. Well, here, and it was here, career staff at EPA working with career staff in Minnesota to review the concerns. Here, here, here's, here's where the, the, the devil in the detail comes to be. Minnesota felt strongly enough about it to document things. Um, and we don't know if all the EPA concerns about the final permit were adequately addressed because the EPA has no document that they can show me or the public or anyone that, um, that these concerns were actually addressed, which goes to the heart of operating under a transparent manner. So we know that somewhere along the line, the EPA, somebody wrote it down, they just didn't keep it in their head, um, comments and uh, read them off maybe on a phone interview to somebody. We all prepare notes. I have notes prepared here. You have notes in front of you. And so um, the question that I have is when will these notes from the EPA be made uh, transparent? There are no, there's notes someplace. Not, every, not everything dealing with Polymet Project and the concerns that were expressed to the MPCA were kept in someone's head. They're written down someplace. They, are they not? I know that we have a FOIA request on this, and we're, we're searching our, our records to find whatever notes that, that um, would be responsive to that. We have certainly provide them to you as well, and I believe we said that in a, in a, in a written response to your, to your letter. Um, I got the written is, response late last night. I sent the letter in February, but you did get back to me. We try to get back, yes. A little late, but you got back. We're, we're trying to be more timely in the future. Today wouldn't have happened. I wonder if I would have heard. So, but I, but this, you know, the, the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, from what they have made uh, public and transparent, um, shows that, uh, quite frankly, that there should be corresponding transparency from the EPA and what we were working on that. Um, Mr. Joyce, I understand you want me to yield to Mr. Simpson for a question? Mr. Simpson? Uh, first question, uh, a serious question. Um, in the past, well, they're all serious. In the past several uh, final appropriations bills, there's been a language that directed the EPA to consult with Forest Service and DOE to provide clarity on a rule that defines biomass as carbon neutral. This is important as trees are key in carbon sequestration. Almost a year ago, the EPA issued a policy statement that seemed to align with the language. Can you update this subcommittee on further steps the EPA has taken to follow the language included in the appropriation bills? We are working on, on that. We hope to have a proposal out this summer. It's, it's a little more difficult than what we originally anticipated. Um, it's taking some time, um, but we, we are moving forward with that, and we intend to have something out this summer. Thank you. Uh, is the EPA, I'll just ask you to directly, directly this, is the EPA following the congressional intent on, on IRIS? I Language? believe so, yes. You believe we are? Yes. I certainly hope that this doesn't come become the position of this committee or any committee in Congress that we have to uh, determine movement of employees within an agency. Uh, that would be overwhelming. We have a hard time 
<laughs> directing our own movements. Uh, but, uh, and finally, it, I, I get, well, not finally, but I, you know, we don't really have to worry about oil refiners because as soon as we pass the Green New Deal, they're going to be out of business. So the fact that we've got all those oil refiners out there and we're trying to do something for them, I don't, and let me ask you, just in general, do any of you over at the EPA really care about the environment? Yes, I would say we all care about the environment. I, I take the mission of the agency very seriously to protect the environment and public health. Thank you. I appreciate that because if you just walk into the middle of the hearing, you'd never know it. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Simpson, I do believe that the EPA cares about the environment. It's just the way that we prioritize some of the work that, that we do, and I don't think you're comments were directed at me, were they not? I just wanted to clear that up for the record. Um, Ms. Pingree. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And in case Mr. Simpson thought I was being too hard on you about the oil refiners, I did mean to say I got distracted by the whole birthday conversation, but I did want to say um, that I am looking forward. Uh, next week there's going to be a little gathering with you and Secretary Purdue to talk about food waste. And I'm one of the co-chairs of the Food Waste Caucus with my Republican colleague, Mr. Newhouse. Um, and I'm looking forward to potentially participating because food waste is a serious concern in our country. We waste about 40% of the food, uh, which is really unthinkable when you think of the resources that go into that and the people who need to access that food as well as methane that's potentially produced in a landfill. So thank you for working with USDA on that, and I look forward to uh, supporting you in, in the work that you're doing. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, back to my disagreements, but <laughs> <laughs> we can there's always those wish. things, yes, and I do appreciate, um, I appreciate all of the work at the EPA and the, and the team that you work with. I did want to talk a little bit about the cross-state air pollution rule. I'm sure you know that cross-state air pollution is a significant problem in Maine. The mass majority of our air pollution, particularly ozone, um, that my constituents are uh, exposed to comes from upwind sources along the eastern seaboard. In short, Maine is on the receiving end of everyone else's air pollution. We call it the end of the tailpipe. The cross-state air pollution rule was intended to address this. However, EPA recently rejected two petitions from Maryland and Delaware to requiring polluting neighboring states to reduce their emissions that were preventing Maryland and Delaware from meeting EPA standards. So why is the EPA undermining the intent of the cross-state air pollution rule by rejecting state petitions? And if the EPA is not going to enforce cross-state air pollution rule, what are you doing to protect states like Maine who are on the receiving end of other states' pollution? Well, um, we, we did reject those, and at, at this point there is a legal challenge for that, and it's pending in the D.C. Circuit, so I do have to be careful what I say there. But um, we do believe that under our analysis that almost all non-attainment areas in the country will reach attainment by the early 2020s. Um, so we believe that um, all the states are on a trajectory, um, particularly when the, on the downwind states, but um, in, in working and looking at the analysis for the, for the petitions from those states for the for the cross-state air pollution rule, um, we believe that the requirements that are currently in place are going to address the, the, the air quality in those states. Um, I'm not sure I agree, but let me move on to one more question. Um, last week, the president of BP America called for a direct federal regulation of methane from new and existing sources, and I'd love to enter an op-ed um, into the record if that's... <laughs> So your administration has already taken actions to weaken the new source performance standards for methane and have indicated that a full-scale rewrite of the standards is forthcoming. You have also rolled back a request that the oil and gas industry merely report their methane emissions. Given the growing consensus from the health community, environmental community, and now industry, that regulation of methane is crucial, how does your administration plan to address this potent pollutant if you won't even collect the information on current emissions? Well, we are, we are working on some targeted improvements to the Quad OA that streamline the implementation, but also a reduced duplicative EPA and state requirements. We're trying to work cooperatively with the agent, with the, with the industry on that. I point out that um, methane, natural gas has doubled over the last 20 years, and um, methane emissions have decreased 16% over that same period. So we're trying to work cooperatively where we don't stifle innovation. There's a lot of innovative work going on with the companies because you, you have to remember the methane itself is the product that they're selling. They don't want the methane re, um, emissions released either. 
So we're working with them to try to figure out the, the best ways of doing this in a cooperative manner so it doesn't stifle innovation, but still gets um, methane re emissions reductions. So I guess, I, again, I, I still have concerns, and it does seem to me that um, rolling back the request to have the oil and gas industry to report their methane emissions is not a productive way to go about limiting the amount of them in the future. Well, we, um, I mean, we are working with them. We, we, we are... Um, we're analyzing the data that we receive from them, working with the states where the where the where the methane pipes are located. Um, but I, I believe we're getting the the information and the emissions reporting that we need from the industry at this point. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you very much, Madam Chair. And uh, I wanted to ask you some more questions, Administrator Wheeler, about something new and different that the agency and the administration have a reverse course on these drastic GLRI cuts. I'm sure you're well aware, since 2015, as a result of the uh, GLRI-funded projects, EPA and its partners have worked collaboratively to prevent over 1 million pounds of phosphorus from leaving farms and entering the Great Lakes. Excessive amounts of phosphorus threaten the Great Lakes ecosystem and priority watersheds by contributing to harmful algal blooms. Harmful algal blooms contaminate surface and drinking water supplies, cause human and animal health effects, and can lead to beach closures that result in lost recreational opportunities. Given the EPA and its partners use GLR funds to prevent over 300,000 pounds of phosphorus from entering the Great Lakes each year, can you speak to the importance of robust funding in the fiscal year 2020 in order to limit phosphorus levels and bolster our ability to prevent harmful algal blooms? Yes, Congressman. In addition to the, the, the full funding of the of GLRI, which the President called for last week, um, we do a lot of other work to try to reduce the phosphorus loading into the Great Lakes and other estuaries as well, as well as, as the HAPs, the, the um, harmful alg algal blooms. Um, I, I think I mentioned earlier today, we just released a, a, a new memo about a month and a half ago um, looking at free market initiatives with the agriculture sector to try to work more cooperatively with agriculture to reduce the nutrient um, um, discharges into the, into the water bodies that end up in the Great Lakes or the Chesapeake Bay or the Puget Sound or the, the other um, estuaries around the country. Um, we're also working on the harmful algal blooms through a number of different research efforts with our, with our own EPA researchers. Um, we have some of the most talented um, research scientists in the, in the country, and several of them are working on this issue. I've visited the, the labs in um, RTP in North Carolina, as well as our Region 7 lab in Kansas City, and our Cincinnati lab, where they're all working on this issue and coming up with innovative ways of, one, to try, trying to detect where there may be problems before problems occur, um, analyzing water samples to help communities deal with um, with the levels as far as making sure that the beaches are, are safe or the, or the lakes are safe to, to swim in. Um, you know, right now, sometimes the testing can take 24 to 48 hours. We're trying to shorten that down so that we can get real-time results out, real-time testing results out to make sure that the water bodies are safe and that people aren't in jeopardy when we have the algal blooms or, or other problems within the, within the lakes and the, and, and the streams where, where people recreate. Um, so we're, we're taking this very seriously, and it's, it's a lot of effort, time, and resources in addition to the $300 million for the Great Lakes Initiative. And certainly we're not alone in this. I've been down the other glades. I was glad to see the president was down there as well last week. The problem exists there, and obviously it's exacerbated the problem with the red tides that you see there, uh, as well as the, the green algal blooms. And I understand in the Naples area, they're suffering from the green algal blooms as well. Mm -hmm. um, how important is controlling the phosphorus levels for supporting the Great Lakes fishing industry? I think I think it's very important. There's there's a lot of issues though with with the fishing industry. Invasive species, of course, is very important. We're trying to work with the, with the Canadians there as well. Um, this is you know the Great Lakes are international, and this is an international issue. Um, but it's not just the phosphorus; it's also invasive species. Um, and it's and it's um, just normal pollution that we that we find in the in the lakes. Um, so we're we're working on this from a number of different number of different levels, number of different ways to try to to try to ensure that the quality of the of the water in the Great Lakes improves. And I have a number of other questions regarding the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, but I'll submit them for the record. 
but I, since you brought it up before, the Healthy Schools Grant Program that you said that you have an interest in talking about, but I think you might have been cut short, that includes $50 million to establish a grant program to protect children and, and, and teachers from environmental hazards where they live, play, and work each day. Like any other parent, I want to ensure that our nation's children are going to school in a clean, safe, and healthy environment. As I understand it, this grant program, the EPA will work with states, tribes, and local communities to address potential gaps in school environment. Can you identify the toxins, the toxics, the pollutants, and other gaps in school environmental health that the EPA is currently not addressing? I wouldn't say this, this, that we're not addressing this. this is, for example, if a school is going to um, address one of, the, one of the issues, such as the, the particular matter of the toxics or the, or the lead in the drinking water, if they're going to be doing any kind of um, um, remodeling of the schools, we wanted to take a look at all the environmental issues and problems at the same time. So it's trying to come up with a comprehensive way for schools to take a look at the em environmental issues that they might might face, um, point them to additional funding. This, the $50 million isn't supposed to be all the funding to clean up all the issues at a school, but to help them do an assessment to determine what are the environmental problems that they face and then help them identify resources to, to correct those problems. How will EPA make sure that it doesn't duplicate efforts of other programs like lead testing in schools grant program or the radon categorical grants? We're, we're, it would try to be the bridge program to bring all of those separate programs under one umbrella so that we can provide a one-stop shop for environmental um, quality for schools around the country. And if the uh, Healthy Schools Grant Program is funded in fiscal year 2020, how do you plan to distribute the funding to the states and tribes? Well, we would work with our authorizers and, of course, our appropriators as well um, to come up with, with, the, with the authorization for the program. We, ha we would have to have the authorization in addition to the appropriations for it. Uh, thank you very much. Like I said, I will submit some records, uh, questions for the record as well, and I uh, yield back what time I do not have. Okay. Thank you. Um, the Healthy Schools Initiative, um, we uh, on the Appropriations Committee have tried our level best <clears throat> not not to uh, be putting pro, uh, funding into programs that are not yet authorized. So I hope you have the authorizers uh, moving on, on this. Um, I have uh, one question, a question for the record. It's 12 o'clock, and I appreciate your, your time with us. Um, time has flown. Yeah. And I think we've had a pretty good time. I think so, The too. Montreal Protocol uh, is what I'd like to talk about. And that, that was, uh, uh, you know, the treaty that uh, phased out the use of refrigerators, propellants, other chemicals, and uh, stratospheric ozone. The ozone layer, we know it's critical because it shields uh, the earth from the sun's ultraviolet rays. Um, the problem's been we, the first generation of replacements for ozone-depleting chemicals known as uh, HF HFCs are uh, themselves very potent greenhouse gases. So U.S. manufacturers have since developed new alternatives that are safer for the ozone layer, and they do not contribute to global warming. The Kaegi, excuse me, Kaegi level amendment, I just said that wrong, would update the Montreal Protocol to phase out the HFCs in favor of these safer alternatives. In January, you told the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee that you had not yet been briefed by career staff on the interagency meetings about this amendment to the uh, Montreal Protocol and that you were reserving judgments until you were briefed. Um, uh, the amendment has extremely broad uh, support among the environmental community, public health experts, major manufacturers, chemical industry, the National Association of Manufacturers, American uh, Chemist, uh, Chemistry Council, the Chamber of Commerce. Um, it's, it's, this amendment will create uh, 30,000 U.S. jobs over the next eight years. It will increase exports by $6 billion, so it's a win-win for the environment and for industry. Um, you've been working on environmental issues, as you pointed out, for nearly 30 years, and I can't think of too many times in my lifetime or yours that we've had so many groups come together from the Chamber of Commerce to environmental communities. Um, um, so I'm, I'm just kind of trying to figure out what, uh, what you can tell us where you are on this because this is, uh, this is an issue that, I've, that I actually participated in a hearing when I was on uh, government oversight. Uh, the Commerce Department and the International Trade Commissions for a long time have been pointed out that some Chinese HF, 
uh, sea producers have been unfairly dumping their products on the U.S. market, hurting our businesses, at the same time hurting the environment. They've been using loopholes to invade tariffs. And, and it, it hurts our manufacturers uh, here at home, and as I said, it's bad for the environment. So you've had about 10 weeks to take uh, the temperature on this uh, to get up to speed. Um, have you taken a position on whether or not you'd be supporting the Kyogly uh, Amendment to the uh, uh, Senate for advice and consent on the Montreal Protocol? Well, well first of all, it, it's not um, the EPA's role or as administrator of the EPA to make the decision on whether or not to submit the treaty to the Senate. Um, you wait, do you, you weigh in on, on the Senate's consideration, do you not? You'll be advised and consent to the Senate on this? Uh, no, that would be the State Department and the White House making the decision whether or not to submit the treaty to the Senate um, for ratification. Um, I, I may be at some point asked by the White House to, to weigh in on this, but I, I've not yet been asked. I've, I've had some conversations with my staff about this. The um, you know the, the I think the issue here and the and the probably the and it's a legal issue is that HFCs are not ozone depleting chemicals and the Montreal Protocol. Um, is just supposed to address ozone depleting chemicals. Um, the Obama administration um, put forward some implementing uh, regulations to try to implement the HFC ban under the Montreal Protocol, and it was struck down by the DC Circuit. Um, so, you know, if we were to move forward, and I, I believe it's Kigali, but I've Kigali. mispronounced it. And I had a, many times. I had something <laughs> in my throat too, so thank you. Um, if um, <laughs> if that were to be, um, so if the if the treaty were to be submitted to the to the Senate for ratification, it would require implementing legislation, in, in order to, in order to allow EPA to issue the regulations to implement it, because we currently lack the authority to regulate um, but you're part greenhouse of the gases group. under the Montreal Protocol. But you're part of the working group that's working on this issue. EPA is. So you our do have career, a seat at the table. Our career staff has been working have a, on it. It's not been elevated to a table. it's not been elevated to a to a principals meeting yet. So you have a seat at the table as the working groups putting forward their ideas. Yes. And so as of now you have no position on this one way or the other. Uh, most of what the work that we've done has gone into some cost analysis as well as um, the analysis under what we could do under the Clean Air Act. Uh, again because of the the Obama regulation that was was uh, was struck down by the D.C. Circuit Court. Um, we've been providing as, assistance you, you, to the State Department, of the White House, as far as what it means to the Clean Air Act, as well as some cost analysis on on what the what the it would mean if it were to be implemented. And so we look forward to seeing what the analysis was being being made public as you move forward. For the record, uh, Mr. Stewart kind of brought this up indirectly about needing more um, more staff. Do you need more staff to do your R as RSF work. Um, the administration, uh, as many of my colleagues have, have said, uh, appears to be making um, uh, it a high priority to dismantle the EPA since it took office. Its methods for doing this, um, many of us see as uh, shrinking the size of the workforce any way it can. So I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to make a statement and then um, tell you uh, what we hope to hear back from you at, at the end of this, because I, I think you're going to have to be um, writing a more detailed answer back to us. Um, in 2016, the EPA pursued an, an aggressive buyout strategy. And since that time passed, since that time passed, the EPA staffing levels have continued to decline in spite of steady funding levels. Now, is it, our questions are, is uh, the decline is it because uh, the staff has just left or retired? Uh, has EPA really failed to, to fill those positions with new hires? Um, and so that goes to your point uh, that you mentioned earlier about having someone work with you on personnel agency staffing. Our concern is when the EPA doesn't have enough personnel on board, the work that the American people expect the government to do goes undone. Permits for small businesses that are needlessly, needlessly delayed, as Mr. Stewart was talking about, perhaps. Requests for technical assistance go unanswered. Environmental crimes go unpunished. Super fun cleanups don't move forward. And uh, for us uh, here in Congress answering to the people that we directly represent, uh, these aren't acceptable issues. They're brought up in our office all the time, from business to people who want to see the environment improve. Um, so uh, we want to... Um, 
do all that we can, and I think our budgets have shown that, to protect the agencies from cuts in order to, for it to go forward and do its business. And you were a congressional staffer, um, so you understand and respect the role that Congress plays when given agencies directions while exercising its power of the purse. So um, one of the questions we're going to be submitting, it'll, it'll be flushed out a little more, but basically we want to know why the uh, agency's been not hiring new staff to replace the people who leave. Um, so we have a, a lot of additional uh, questions. Um, I expect uh, that you will get back to us on the record on that. But, you know, the EPA just can't shrink anymore if it's going to be able to fulfill its mission of public health as well as the, as you pointed out, some of the roles that it has in working with industry for uh, predictability. Um, so uh, we look forward to hearing about what has been happening with, with, with staffing levels because I think you heard that from both sides of the aisle up here. And as I said, our budgets have been uh, inclusive of giving you the dollars needed to keep minimum staffing levels moving forward so that we don't create more backlogs. Um, with that, Mr. Joyce and I and the members of the committee really appreciate you being here. We look forward to uh, hearing back uh, from things on the record. Mr. Simpson? Madam Chairman, if I could just say, I, I hope nobody took offense to what I said. I certainly wasn't referring to the chairwoman. Uh, what I was trying to, the point I was trying to get at is that no matter what the EPA does, it's the most beat up agency probably in the federal government because uh, you're involved in almost everything. And when we have a Democratic administration, Republicans think that the EPA is trying to control the world, and we criticize the heck out of that. When a Republican administration comes into place, Democrats oftentimes think you don't care about the environment. That's where that question came from, or or whatever. And so I wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to uh, say anything about anybody in particular. Uh, the chairwoman and I are very good friends, and have we worked uh, on some very good. And so. Congresswoman Pingree, we kind of jab each other about potatoes and other things <laughs> all the time. But I would, I would just say, I, f I do find it interesting when the president finds out more about his budget, how it changes as we go along. Uh, now we have uh, funding for the Great Lakes Initiative, and we have funding requested for Special Olympics and other things. So as he learns more about what he's requested, uh, it will be interesting to see how this finally comes down. Uh, maybe OMB will go over and talk to him. To, to quote a fellow appropriations member, Mr. Cole, the president proposes and the Congress will be doing the disposing. Um, once again, Mr. Wheeler, thank you very much. And uh, we do look forward to uh, timely answers. Uh, we are all working under tremendous budget crunch with uh, after recovering from the, uh, trying to recover, should I say, from the government shutdown. And uh, we have uh, every indication from our leadership that we plan to have our appropriation bills done on time, on the floor, uh, done by June. So uh, anything that you could give us would be greatly appreciated. Could, could I um, ask for one more minute? I know usually yes. witness doesn't want to talk more, but I just want to re respond on the workforce issue. I do take that very seriously. I think we're at a, at a critical juncture at the agency and, and very large challenges with the number of retirees that we have pending with 40% of our workforce eligible to retire over the next five years. When I was a congressional staffer, I, I worked for Senator Voinovich for a couple of years, and I worked with him on um, staffing levels at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. This was in the early 2000s, and at that point, the NRC had 40 to 50 percent of their employees eligible to retire, and they're probably um, the most technical, um, the, the staffing at the NRC is probably the most technical experts in the federal government. Um, we might have the second most. And I, I think it's very critical. That's why I hired a, a new human resources director. And I've, whenever I meet with the career managers across the agency, I um, talk to them about the staffing issues and the recruitment. And you know, there's a number of issues that we have to address as a federal government. And one of them that I don't think the federal government is really addressing yet is as we hire new people, particularly millennials, as they come out of college, most of them don't stay with one job their entire career. We have a history of the agency of having people work there 30, 40 years. We actually have 10 people who will hit their 50-year milestone next year at our 50th anniversary for the agency. We've been with the agency 49 years. I've told all of them that you have to stay one more year to get recognized. <laughs> um, but we have an incredible workforce at the agency. I'm very proud of them. And I'm, I've told them that I want to leave the agency stronger than I found it, particularly when it comes to the workforce. So I appreciate you wanting to work with me on that, and I'm very happy to work with you on those well, issues. Well, thank you for that. And uh, the fact that we had a government shutdown did not 
uh, make people feel very uh, stable or secure in working for the federal government. And many of them could make more outside in the private industry, but they choose to serve their country in this way by protecting our air and our water. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you.